the Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast. All right, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Michael Brainerd. He has a PhD, 15 plus years of experience as, as a management consultant, senior executive, a coach, manager, entrepreneur, and researcher. From a professional boxer early in his career to business rainmaker to leveraging talent, Michael knows how to produce business and real life results. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm fired up to be here. Yeah, stoked. You've done a lot of stuff in your career. I mean, from from the professional boxer all the way to you know working for big companies and now on your own with uh, with what you're doing now. Yeah. And write you know wrote, wrote a book, an author, about to do a, um, a whole audio book. It's awesome. So uh, t- tell us about Brainerd Strategies. Thanks for asking. So um, started Brainerd Strategy with an idea on a beach, cool. and uh, I Here came in, out uh, of San Diego. Yeah, in Cardiff. I uh, was sitting on a beach. I had just come out of a student loan industry where I was able to do some strategy and development work, corporate development. Prior to that, I'd always been in management consulting, so it was my first real job. And we were able to sell that company and sat on the beach for about a month and thought there's a real blend between sort of the strategy guys and the org behavior and leadership guys. There weren't a lot of firms that were combining those two business models. So I thought I'd come to the market, sell to the C-suite solutions that range from M&A integration and business strategy all the way to the people and culture side. So put together a great team and we're still kicking since 2005. Awesome, man. So how did you go from being a professional boxer to, you know, your own thing? Is it uh, like, I mean, probably obviously we're much younger doing the boxing. Yeah. What, what got you into boxing? Like, what was that just always a thing you liked? Yeah. So first Beat of all, yeah, <laughs> not so much that, but the um, first of all, what got me out of it was necessity. You hit your talent ceiling in a combat sport and you can get hurt pretty quickly. So yeah. I was out of there. But uh you know, what got me into it was really my grandpa. When I was coming up, I was always a wrestler and a football player, and I liked mixing it up. And my grandpa pulled me aside and started teaching me, the, like, the strategy of it, the the way you do it. And I got endlessly interested in boxing, similar to wrestling, totally different setup, but similar in the way body control, discipline, mm-hmm. mixing it up. So I, he got me interested, and then I – there was a local guy's legendaries in the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. He beat James Tony. His name's Dave Tiberi. He and his brother trained me when I was a teenager. And I ate it up because they showed me the next level and what it could be. And I was a good enough athlete. And the next thing I know, when I graduated college, I had a very little money and a small idea of what I wanted to be in my life. So I thought I'd try pro boxing. I had an opportunity to sign uh, with top rank boxing. And that's what moved me out from the East Coast to San Diego. And the rest led to about a three-year career that was very enjoyable and very painful. <laughs> I bet you still have some injuries from that. Or... You can see my nose. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, this wasn't in the in the questions, but um, have you heard of Andrew Tate? I know he's like a like a super popular, like yeah, uh, kind of infamous and loved and hated. But he was a kickboxer, right? Right. Yeah. I don't know much about him. I have heard about him. I know he's a YouTube or social media guy, and he did. A, a legit career in kickboxing so that's all i know really yeah. i don't know anything about him i spent a lot of time in mma after my boxing career coaching some of the local mma guys that are pretty famous and you would know from around here mm-hmm. and I had the opportunity to actually coach and even sponsor a couple of the guys as they advanced in their career and frankly john as a side note our firm has helped fighters get out of fighting Okay. By supporting the end of their career and fighting and then helping them transition. As an example, KJ Noons, who's here from San yeah, Diego. KJ. Yeah, he transitioned out after being a champion in Strike Force. Now he's an LA firefighter and, and he was kind of searching in our firm, being management consultants, having lots of connections in corporate world, have endeavored to help many fighters transition because for me the transition was pretty simple. I wanted to go to graduate school and study what I do now. But for a lot of these guys, they spend their whole twenties deep down in the trenches of fighting, not with a wide view of how society and the world operates. So it's been a real joy to help some of these guys find their path into media and broadcasting, firefighting, and even corporate roles, or even back to school in some cases. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, 
I've talked to uh, KJ a couple times, and um, I remember he when he got into real estate for a little bit. Yeah, that's and that's right. kind of how I met him. Yeah, but uh, yeah, he was a good fighter, and um, it's cool that you you're able to leverage kind of your past and then bring it into how you yeah. can help people, you know, into onto the next uh, phase of their life. Because as we all know, like you said earlier you know, boxing is a shelf life unless you're one of these major yeah. Sugar Ray or something like yeah, that, right? right? Um, so I saw your video on the roles we play on teams. Mortgage brokers are often made up of teams. Can you explain and expand kind of on team roles and how that might help mortgage brokers? Yeah, so first of all, mortgage brokers, and as I understand it, because you and I were in a Indian princess tribe with almost all mortgage brokers and real estate guys, yeah. but uh, so teams work off of levels of interdependence, right? So you think about, John, think about like a hockey team or a basketball team. Mm -hmm. You kind of got to know where each person is and what they're doing and what their capabilities are at every moment because your success and the team's success depends on that high level of interdependence. Right. Think about a swimming team or a wrestling team. You're not getting much help. You're out there on your own. You're bringing your points back to the team, not a high level of interdependence. So when you think about mortgage brokers, one of the first things you want to think about as a senior leader and a senior executive is being authentic about the level of interdependence required for the broker to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. So you got the processor and the servicer and you got different dependencies there. And the team wants to operate relative to its level of interdependence. So high interdependence, we're looking for high trust, high structures to bond the teams together, low levels of interdependence. We, we don't necessarily have to worry about the relationship things as much, but we worry about the handoffs, the transitions, and the accountabilities being clear. So different flavors. With mortgage brokers, you know, you would have to find that right mix of collegiality right. and warmth with structure and handoff transitions and accountability. Yeah, because I think some people, they recognize they're super skilled in one area, but then they may not have other, you know, like maybe right. they're not a marketing, they don't have a great marketing eye, so you might have like a team member that's, focus on marketing and then you might have a team member that's focused on like more detail stuff or you know one's more originating that's like right. really good networker so if you put them all together you've that's got right. this powerhouse right and that's the role of the leader right so the leader says where are the skills talents natural abilities of each member where's that sminess that subject matter expertise and how to best bring that out with the requisite team members and you have to be careful doing it because humans are kind of weird right so you get mm -hmm. teams much greater than 12, 13, 14, they're very difficult to manage. So right. with mortgage brokers, those teams that I've seen in certain banks, mortgage banks that I've had the pleasure to work with, um, smaller tiger teams of four and six seem to be the right size for management and performance. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, and they can all kind of bring their skills together, kind of right. like you're talking about with like athletics and how yeah. Like a hockey team, or my son's a you know water polo player. I see how they all work together. You know, they to. got they're they're uh, if they don't if they're not gelling, then it's not going to be a good game. <laughs> That's right. Um, what's the <clears throat> difference between leadership and management? Because obviously, you can be a good manager, but not necessarily a good leader. Or do you need both to be a good manager? Yeah, well, I would say it differently. If you're a good leader, management is easy. Gotcha. If you're a poor leader management feels difficult mm -hmm. or some people don't even like it right so let me dig deeper into that it's an age-old question i've been getting since i've studied this topic in graduate school i'll just throw out some words management very important not to be devalued relative to leadership when we get into the workforce if we're high performers and if we're kind of likable you get tapped on the shoulder to be a manager for the first time, right? Sure. And so, well, great, what do I do with that? Nobody's told me what to do. All of a sudden, I got a 50 year old person, I'm 30, <laughs> who I've got to, you know, get the idea, right? Right. So, let's think about management. Management is what the organization asks you to do guide, control, report, monitor, continuously improve, run the operations of whatever the business is. Yeah. Look, if you're not a great leader, that's hard to do. If you've got some leadership chops, it's not so hard. It's not so difficult, but leadership is a different set of skills, right? It is about vision and strategy and culture and emotional intelligence and self-awareness and understand decision-making processes. And, and so leadership is more that pull where management is more that push. Mm. You see highly effective leaders and sometimes people, they know it, but they can't define it. Just it's a feeling, right? Mm -hmm. What guys like me do is we kind of break that down 
all the way down to its elements and kind of help people get better on leadership. Why? Because they're already been tasked to manage. And so we're trying to bet that if we can increase their leadership effectiveness, the management of the company, as well as that person's management acumen, shoots up. So that's the yeah. that's how I view leadership management. Distinct sets of skills, both required for high effectiveness and organizational performance. So you think you can really improve the leadership skills, which then would make the management job easier, kind of like almost like training in, in a sense, like or like like athletic training before you're going to be like, I, you know, like my son's water polo, he, he has to go work out. They have to do a ton of laps in the pool. They do all these drills. And then, uh, you know, obviously when he's on the in the in the pool, then it's a different game because you put the work in to train. Is that kind of what you think like leadership is this thing you really have to hone in and it's a perfect analogy. I have a stepson plays water polo, the same thing. Now think about it. And here's what happens in business where you see a great deal of dysfunction, whether ethical breakdowns, performance breakdowns, arrogance, mm -hmm. ego. Just think about this. Okay, so your son's young. Your son might go to college and play water polo where he'll be training and practicing every day because someone demands it. Right. All of a sudden you go into corporate America or large organizations and you've got the big bonus, you've got the big car, you're 45 years old, you got the vacation house, the family's taken care of, your Maslow hierarchy needs are good. Why should I keep practicing? Practicing's hard. Yeah. Lifting weights is hard. Getting up before school is hard. Read, let's now transition. Reading, introspection, going to conferences, unpacking things about yourself when you're 50 that means something different when you were 30. Right. This is hard work. Right. Much of us work hard to get to a certain place in our career and then the work becomes eh, the, the aside. So you don't your, analogy, in effort your like... analogy is perfect, right? So now I'm 50, I'm 40. I know that. I've seen that before. Right. I can make that assumption. Well, leadership effectiveness actually can plateau with experience and with success because you nailed it. And this is a whole premise of my firm. Leadership is the disciplined daily activity of looking inside and outside and how I am affecting human beings outside of me. Whether you're a Navy SEAL, whether you're a corporate leader, whether you're you, are you able to look inside yourself and in your environment and see those two things clearly and affect people positively? Quickly define positive. In athletics, it's a little different. In your world and my world, it's how do I affect performance of human beings and the engagement or motivation of those human mm -hmm. beings? Day to day, week to week, year to year, performance and engagement of human beings is the denominator or the outcome of leadership. Where athletics, the outcomes are obviously different, but the discipline and the practice are the same. Right. And I think the end goal for you know anyone listening or watching is obviously we want to make more money and make it easier, right? We don't want That's it right. to be... You know, we don't, the grind is just, once you get to our age, you're like, do I really have to keep grinding? Yeah. But, you know, I think when you put the effort into the parts of your career that are going to help make things easier, that's right. then you're, you're working smarter, not harder, right? I always say, and I, I literally said it this week, the more effective leader you are, the less hours in a week you work. Mm. Why? How do you get there? It's the engagement of those around you. If those around you are walking, if those around you are jogging, how about those around you seeing around corner, anticipating problems, jumping in with a solution rather than complaining about a problem, reaching out to collaborate with people without being told to. These are things within that mortar between the bricks that make your life as a senior leader a little easier. How do you get there? The grind is different. You're grinding, but you're not grinding in the same way you were in your 20s and 30s. You're more grinding here mm. and here. The grind is how do I engage and light people up? How do I knock down barriers to full performance? That's your grind, and it's a different grind, and you're right. It's a lot <laughs> less laborious than right. the grind that we were doing 10, 20 years ago. <laughs> so how does someone uh, – that's a good point. How does someone um, – get better obviously you could read books you can watch podcasts like this right. you read your book like like is there you know i i just got i just found out about this thing called headway have you heard about that no it's this insane app that summarizes books down oh, to yeah. 15 minutes like blinkist okay competitor yeah. to blinkist right yeah so i just like i'm starting to do it like every morning like i'll, I'll have a workout and i'll like Perfect. go through a book you know and a, and a book that i like or, or that i've heard about um, is that an effective way to start or like you know, do you need like a coach or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, all the, all the things you mentioned are great. The idea of the, that you're still intellectually curious, that you're still wanting to read something to find an insight. You might not always get it, but you're endeavoring to do it. That's the first step. The first step is you got to say, this is a never ending journey. I can always be a better dad, a better leader, right. a better colleague. 
That's the first step. Now, fill in the blanks. Reading. Reading summaries. TED Talks are wonderful resources. Introspecting. But I'll tell you this, one of the things that I find that great leaders are doing all the time, whether it's driven through the system like the Navy SEALs or corporations, or you do it on your own, you got to seek outside in feedback. Yeah. You got to be able to be comfortable hearing things from your ecosystem that you may not want to hear. So you got to surround yourself with people who are honest. And you got to seek that feedback about your impact on them because whether you call it 360 feedback, which is a formal process, or you're a person that's open to being critical. Self-critical is great, but the way that you're impacting people often isn't aligned with your intention, Mm. right? So you might say to someone, hey, attaboy, thank you, great job. Well, that person is an African-American in their 20s, and you just said attaboy, and the word boy hits that person different than it hits me. Mm -hmm. I'm using an example to say, we intend to be effective as leaders. The reason we need outside input outside in feedback is we often want to make sure that the impact we're having on people is aligned with our intention, if that makes sense. Because why? As a leader, what actually matters is how I'm being perceived. I'll leave you with one final thought on that. You'll hear immature leaders talk about, well, that's how they see me, but that's not how I really am. The answer is if <laughs> you put yourself reality. yeah if you put yourself in a leadership chair the perception is actually more important because you're self delusional from your cognitive biases so right. it's really interesting to see so this idea of outside and feedback I can't emphasize it enough however you do it you got to keep doing that throughout your journey because that's the true measure of how you're improving in your effectiveness that's good man I, I've heard a lot about you know how how valuable it, it is to get a coach yeah because. That exact That's thing, it. they're yeah. going to be honest with you. They're, you're paying them to be honest and tell, give you shit if you need to, you know, That's right. some shit and uh, and not not sugarcoat it. And Where a re- like a you know you're a boss, they're going to you know you're affecting their vacation, you're affecting their day. Yeah, absolutely, they're right. going to probably kick gloves around you and and uh, and some bosses aren't good coaches. Right. You asked me about leadership and management before. We do a lot of executive coaching ourselves and a lot of executive development. I always talk about the three pillars: LMC, lead, manage, and coach. If you're an executive, your job is to coach and get the best out of the talent. But a lot of bosses don't know how to coach. So right. to your point, coaching is yet another mechanism for outside and feedback. If you're a good executive coach, you're able to call people on their BS or at least question it and yeah. make sure that they're being challenged. So that's that whole industry of executive coaching is a form of outside and feedback with a professional rather than a line boss who may or may not be great at it. For sure. I do it. It's a big industry. Yeah, for, that's that's good. So, um, you know, right now it's a little dry out there. The the rates are high, as you probably have heard on the news or whatever. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of like you know this kind of down. Like, what am I going to do? Do I need to get into another industry? How do I you know turn my business around when there really isn't that much? The pie is shrunk, right? Right. Uh, there's not a lot of people refinancing. There's not a lot of purchases because the the listings are down. Um, what are like, what are some motivational things that you do? Like we, we, we can't all have a perfect day. Right. And, and so you got to do your daily things, but like when, when like overall the sentiment about your industry or about your, just your life, you, you know, we go through hard things in life. What is one tool you could share with our audience about just what can, can pick you up or help you get back on the, you know, motivation train? So timely question. I'll be at an offsite next week doing strategic planning with a REIT. Okay. And I did interviews with the exec team the other day. And if I heard high interest rates one more time, I was going to jump out the window. So <laughs> yeah, I have a sense for uh, what's going on, even though I'm not in the industry. I do a lot of management consulting. Part of that is strategic planning. So uh, I'll give you one that, that hits my brain and I live by. The Stockdale Paradox. Stockdale Paradox. Admiral Stockdale was the longest held prisoner of war in Vietnam. And when he was interviewed for his book, I'm shortcutting the story, said, who would pass away first? Who would not make it in the prisoner of war camps in Vietnam? And his answer was the optimists. Mm. And I remember the interviewer saying, why the optimists? He said they had an unrealistic view of their surroundings. They acted unrealistically because they didn't take in the depth of the surroundings. Mm. Well, who died second? The pessimists. <laughs> pessimists, Why? You can imagine they don't, they fail to thrive, failure to try, failure to escape. Which one are you? He said, I'm both. <laughs> so what I find in my life, and I think would apply, frankly, in your industry, is in any crisis, there's an opportunity. Right. Is it today? Maybe not. But what's the opportunity that this might bring about a month from now, a quarter from now, a year from now? 
in any opportunity, there's crisis. So mm-hmm. sometimes we're up with people printing money and the cash cow runs out within a quarter 2008's recession right. or a month. And have we prepared our business? Are we diversified? Do we have different channels? In your world, are people doing reverses? What percentage of reverse versus origination versus these price sectors in the different mortgage? I know there are different skill sets and different price points. How diversified are we? Because when these times change, we have to have the right mindset. I don't care what industry you're in. The mindset is crisis and opportunity are a paradox. Mm. The Stockdale paradox. If you can hold two truths at the same time, it improves your leadership effectiveness and improves your attitude and your mindset. Yes, today is horrible. Also today, I have my health, I'm going home, and I'm making plans for next month to pivot this way, this percentage, to adapt to the market conditions. Because let's be honest, in a high interest rate environment, you have some opportunities to do some things long term that you might not do when you're chasing cash every day. So yeah. This idea of the right mindset and balancing in a paradoxical way two equal truths that may seem opposing is an incredible skill to gain as a leader and, frankly, as someone in your world is so volatile. <laughs> yeah, that's a good example because I, I mean, I can't, I've never been in, in a prison or in a concentration camp or anything. Thank, Thank God. But like <laughs> that, I mean, I think, I don't know what I, I think there would be the initial pessimism, like, even though, even though I'm an optimist, I'd be like, holy crap, yeah. this is real. This is terrible. Right. And then the optimism would kick in, like, I'm going to escape. Or I'm going to get out of here somehow. Uh, but, like, I, what I'm interpreting you saying is, like, kind of the idea of hope for the best but prepare for the worst. Or the yeah. other way around, prepare for the worst, hope for the Either best. Way. Because um, we would always know storms are coming and they pass. That's and right. so if you're not prepared for that. So we hope that a lot of mortgage brokers that are listening, they actually did prepare for the worst. The truth is, you know, just like I think most, you know, yeah. athletes when they're young and they're making a ton of money in, in sports or whatever, yeah. they think it's going to last forever. Same with music business, same with, you know, with finance or with mortgage, you know, where they're buying the cars, they're, they're, they're spending the money, thinking it's never going to end. And then lights go out, rates go up, we're stuck, you know, people are stuck. So, um, you know, when you're in that position, you know, you, you tend to not learn, you turn, tend to learn from that mistake because that happened to me in 08 and that's why I did things differently this time right. around. But, you know, if you're in that situation, I mean, I guess you have to just think like there's going to be hope. There's going to be the sun's going to shine again. And I mean, what's your other choice? Yeah. Right? I, mean, I mean, put your head in the sand. And no, just... you, you, it's, it's, you have to be real though. Like you just said, it's important. This is real. This is dire. This could hurt me and my family. I could lose a in Del Mar in 2008 and 2009, I saw more Yukons with fancy rims being for sale. You know what I mean? The right. were like, I got to get rid of this. That so my lifestyle exceeded what the new reality could provide. So how do we, if we walk around with a mindset of both are true, this is wonderful and there's going to be a dark day because yep. with some maturity and wisdom, you know it. Yep. And I'm in a dark day and it's going to be great. And begin to live our life in that paradox. It allows us to prepare. It allows us to be more flexible. It allows us to develop learning agility, looking for different things. When we're wildly successful, we have to go look that wide right. to, to meet our needs, right? So in different, so this idea of being learning agile and dealing with both sides in good times and bad is just a critical, critical, critical life skill, success skill. Yeah, I like what you said about, you know, it may not be today, the right. opportunity. That's right. It could be tomorrow. And so I think that's where the optimism can kind of kick in and say, yeah, today sucks, yeah. but you know what? What's going to happen tomorrow? Like, it, there could be a really cool opportunity where I can, uh, you know, and then and then you actually have to use that brain power and exercise your brain to think outside of the box and sort of go find that's you right. know, like when things dry up. So that's, that's good. Um, what about building trust? I know you talk about that in yeah. your, in your trainings and your book and stuff like that. Um, it's critical obviously, because people don't want to do business with someone they can't trust. Absolutely. Clearly. How do you build that trust and, and how does, how do you work on that to, to make your sales better? So trust comes up. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist by background. So whether you do org behavior stuff, whether you're doing change management stuff, whether you're doing leadership stuff, even strategy content, it just comes up everywhere, right? We're human beings and trust is just critical. It's right. Okay. How do you do it? So one of the things we talk about in business is three things. Frequency of interaction, which COVID has hurt. Mm -hmm. Frequency of interaction. 
You may not love me. You may not lend me $100, but you might lend me $5. We all have that uncle that we love, but we're not going to lend him $100. Right. That's trust, believe it or not. Trust isn't always up with people, rainbows and butterflies. It is the output of a series of interactions that informs how intimate you're going to be with me. Mm-hmm. Number one is frequency of interaction. Believe it or not, the second thing we do to develop trust is we demonstrate vulnerability. Differently said, if we're self-protective or all-knowing or righteous, the other party often has that instinct to poke holes in us and find out where we're not so smart. Yeah, because not everything's perfect. But if we show up as imperfect and vulnerable and needing support and help, most humans will support and help. Right. This idea of frequency of interaction, which takes work in your world, sales, sales is hard. Yeah, a lot of touches. Number two is being vulnerable. Yes, you're the expert, but you're not. We're partners here. We're going to do this together. Being willing to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me go find out get back to you. Huge. To develop trust. Even if it's not altogether real. I mean, you got to be authentic, but I mean, your your mindset is one of vulnerability and partnership. And then third is your own trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. So you told me, uh, Jeep dealership, my car was going to be here on Thursday. Right. For a good reason, it's not. Do I gain trust in you or not? Because I had to call you on Friday to ask. Yeah. Right. You could have called me Thursday at noon and said, hey, Brainerd, heads up. Your Jeep's not ready. All of a sudden, I trust that dealership. I go back. Right. Because I had to chase you to find out why my car and why. And I forgot I got busy. Now I'm going to take that business somewhere else the next time. Trust is fundamental. Right. To all relationships where business relationships, either leadership to subordinate or seller to customer, Mm -hmm. are just another form of relationship. So frequency of touches, vulnerability, our own vulnerability, and our own trustworthiness, delivering what we say and all that stuff. These are critical antecedents to beginning to develop trust. And you can be an actual trustworthy person, but then because you're forgetful or something, you could literally lose that trust and someone's perception of you would not be that of a trustworthy person, right? That's what I'm suggesting, whether conscious or unconscious. You are reading me with every interaction and I am reading you. Yeah. And you have a family of origin and a culture and an expectation that I can't know. Yeah. So that's why I start with the fundamentals. Fundamentals are frequency of touch, vulnerability, and your own trustworthiness. Yes, there's lots of other things. And now there's tools for that. Like Absolutely. there's CRMs. There's I mean, one of the, my favorite thing on the on the iPhone is, hey Siri, remind me in ten <laughs> minutes to go check you know whatever, right. <laughs> check the oven so I don't burn you know whatever it is or what, call back my client you know. That's and, right. and, so you can do this stuff, I think, if you know, because I'm not, I'm a, I'm a visionary, I'm not a detail person. So there's times when I have to use tools to make sure I'm a successful person. Right. What are some tools that you think that, uh, that you use or that you suggest to use? I'll, I'll, you and I are old enough to remember a Thomas guide and a notebook in our front seat of our car, right? Yeah, that was, yeah. that's, how about I say go with those tools? Just to be a little bit. Yeah, right now you can talk into your phone. Um, Frankly, these apps, you talk about your phone generally, but there's very specific apps, um, Scannable, Evernote, there's all all kinds of little things that you can put because like you, like all of us, I mean, we're managing a lot of stuff, right? So to expect that we're going to remember and be responsive is kind of hard. Uh, All I'll say is all the tools you need to do your day to day, whether you're a visionary or detail oriented, whether you're a person I test type A and B, they're right in your phone. You just got to use them, right? Sometimes right, you got to remember to use them. Yeah, you got to just use them to your point. Just, hey, Siri, put this meeting on my calendar. Hey, Siri, Wednesday, I got to work on this document because the client expects it Friday. I mean, it's just, yeah. I'm, there's nothing that I found that's particularly fancy. The one thing that I have found during COVID that I like. This idea of texting, mm-hmm. like your kids are thinking, what's email? Right. We grew up on email, right? They don't even text anymore. Yeah, it's just now, Snapchat, and now right? And now, now they get to Snapchat. <laughs> okay, so this is what uh, you and I are roughly the same age. <laughs> this idea of videoing texts. I know it sounds weird. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. What just happened? Oh, we, I think we said, hey. Hey, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this? Yeah, like, so you I, have a personal yeah. assistant that just try to get you to talk. <laughs> That's that's your robotic assistant you had to pay eighty thousand dollars for ten years ago. <laughs> Seriously, all right. Yeah, well, the, what were you? What was he saying? What were you saying? Sorry. I was going to say, being creative with the technology you have. During COVID, we weren't together, so I would send a text or an email, like all of us did, right? right? So all of a sudden, I had the idea of, I'm going to say this with my face on video and make a little joke at the end and hit send to my staff. 
hey guys, remember this. It's not going to be this, and tomorrow's that, and tomorrow's the other day. I could have typed it. Right. I'm like, it's it's something that they may stick in their brain a little differently. So sometimes using the modalities we have in a different and creative way are also interesting, right? I like that so, idea of just doing yeah, like, a quick video and sending it yeah, as a text instead of a text message to... That's right. I yeah. Mean, I use audio and video text now far more than I ever did because of COVID because I'm trying to come up with... Because why do you communicate? Yeah. You communicate to share information, to engage and fire up people and nuisance. So... Why do it in the same old boring Monday morning staff meeting or email? Right? Never, There's... never know. Let them know your next move, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just keep it keep it creative. Let's talk about competition, right? Like, so again, as things get tighter in a business, or even just regardless, like everything in life has competition. Right. What are things you can do to increase your advantages when it comes to competition, either in business or life, or what? You know, what what are your what are your thoughts? So this will surprise you because I went from the world's most competitive human being, according to my mother and father, to somebody who's changed their mindset on this. I'll think about a mutual friend, Bryce Aberg, as an example. I can think about many others. I can think about my own journey. When things get tight, the natural tendency is to go for survival. My Maslow hierarchy of needs, that base is, uh uh-oh, mortgage, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, gas, right? Right. Even people who are making Food, what they're making, right? People oxygen. live in an RVR. We don't know their situation. People have a right. great deal of debt. You know, things get really squirrely in a tight environment. But I'd like to challenge our view. I like the term co-opetition. Why am I going to co- compete with John Maddox? Why don't I figure out what he does great, what I do great, and maybe we can be helpful to each other. We're both going to go still back to our desk and fight to get that loan or do that thing. Sure. But I like to expand away from competition into what I call co-opetition, Co- mm. cooperation and competition. It goes, back, yeah, it goes back to that idea of a paradox again, right? So yeah. if I spend my time competing with those around me in my close ecosystem, because our industries are mostly small, including yeah. my industry. I know everybody in San Diego and Orange County who does what I do. Yeah, this is mortgage business, a small industry. We all kind of know each other too. Beat each other up on price or this or that. No, go be great. Do your thing and lend a hand. I call it net exporting. I got to get better at net exporting because when I give more, I get more. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds philosophical, but co-opetition. When things get tight, who are those around me that can be helpful at times? Who are those around me that I'm competing with but still care about me and I care about them? Share information, share an insight. So I like the idea of co-opetition, being less individually competitive and more about competing where appropriately and be open about it and cooperating where appropriately. Because when resources are tight, think about what I just said. Resources are tight. There are less of them. Same amount of people going for them. Maybe we can split the pie differently rather than fight for the biggest piece. True. And so I like the idea of co-opetition. I like the idea of being a net exporter. I've learned in my life, the more I give, the more I get back. And so um, you're an example of that. I asked you for some for a favor today, and you said, all right, let's do something together. Yeah. We're not competitors, but we're cooperating to get a better outcome, right? So uh, I, my views on competition have changed dramatically throughout my lifespan, hopefully for the healthier and the better. But look, we're going to compete. I'm not saying don't be competitive, but there are sure. times when resources are tight that this idea of co-opetition overrules the idea of going fighting for yours. If you fight for yours, you might get yours. Kind of like a win-win versus like I win, you lose. And even in shades of gray. Hey, today I want a little more. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow you might win a little more. I have comp- competitors out there that I'm dear friends with. I want them to have a healthy living and do great. And some of my clients, I don't really have a direct specialty. So it's useful to be able to call them and be able to help my client. Because at the end of the day, my client remembers that. And that creates value for me long term. So great. win-win is not in the hippie sense, but in a real business sense, it's it's a real thing. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, we can all say that we have, we've had help along the way. So do you have any shout outs to someone that maybe have helped, kind of helped you along the way or yeah, so, contributed to your success? Yeah, I mean, a number of coaches and, and managers. There's a guy named Jim Greenway that really helped me. He gave me a, you guys do deals and sometimes big deals. And I called him on a Sunday. I said, we're going to hear from Erickson tomorrow. It's a multi-million, multi-tens of million dollar deal. And I said, I, I just want to run everything by you. And he stops me. He goes, you don't have to run anything by me. I trust you. And if you get it wrong, there'll be consequences. And I thought, well, <laughs> well that hurts. But it caused me a sleepless night. But he taught me about thinking on my own and not over-helping people as a coach and a mentor and, and a leader. And different people taught me different things in my life. My grandpa taught me the value of stoicism and steadiness and emotional intelligence. 
but in a real way. And I learned from my daughter every day watching her journey. I really, in a humble but real sense, learned from my daughter. And um, Kelly, the woman I married, has this weird ability to love everyone, and I'm judgy at times. And it's just, <laughs> I just, I'm. Just, if you're awake, what you were talking about, John, you're looking at a book before a book summary before work or something when you're looking at other people, maybe that whole person isn't the one, but there's a piece of that person, right? Mm -hmm. There's a fierceness there. Paul Vaden, uh, Hall of Fame boxer in San Diego, IBF, IBC, WBC, WBA middleweight champion. We trained in the same gym together. We've been friends forever. You'll never meet a sweeter kind of person. You can't believe he was a fighter. <laughs> you watch him in the ring and he was fierce. Yeah. These these are examples of people I learned from, right? These people cool. that manage two different paradoxes, two different realities. Um, and you just got to go and take, you got to take that learning. And so, yeah, lots of people that a couple, I've mentioned a couple of people, but uh, it's totally fun. Our mutual friend, Eric Roden, right? Yeah. That guy could have fun anywhere. <laughs> totally. I can't have fun everywhere. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you have joy? Yeah. Well, they, they say like we are the sum total of what the five people we spend the most time right. with. So, you get a little, you know, everyone kind of rubs off on each other. You hope that yeah. you get the good sides, right? Like I've had friends, not to name names, where I, we've rubbed off the wrong way. We we, we uh, had a little too much fun, <laughs> you know, out late at night or whatever. Right. But, you know, the good thing is that you can, you know, get the good things from different people That's and right. like kind of what you said. And um, yeah. how did you become an author? Thanks for uh, So I do quite a bit of speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of funny. The evolution is get on your feet in front of a client or you're not going to make any money. You get to be an analyst your whole career. I don't want to, I got to make some money. Right. Um, okay. So now I'm pretty good facilitating groups. And so now that group says, Hey, come to our corporate end of year meeting or sales meeting or annual kickoff. Learned how to do that. Um, got asked to write for Forbes magazine. So I have about 12 or 13 offers, uh, uh, um, um, articles, articles mm -hmm. on Forbes. And I like it. Um, they give me a wide, birth and asked me to just be a thought leader in certain areas. And then that led to the opportunity to publish with Leader Press and Simon and & Schuster. And I was invited to write a leadership book. And so my, uh, my points of view on leadership and strategy are kind of wacky. And so, uh, no, but they're, they're cool and they're out of the so, box, which yeah, so makes it a little more memorable. And so it's been a, it's been painful and it's been a pleasure at the same time <laughs> to get a book out of me. <laughs> How long did it take you to write this new book? Three years. Okay. I started about three years ago putting pieces of it together, and I couldn't see it really coming together. And then about a year ago, I saw in the middle of COVID, frankly, I had a little more free headspace, and I saw it come together at any year. And then I got together in earnest with the publisher and sort of got it out of me. So, nice. What's the title? This is How to Become an Effective Leader, The Eight Disciplines to Build Your Executive Leadership Effectiveness. So this book is targeted at any manager, director, vice president, and any company who endeavors to be an enterprise leader, endeavors to be in the C-suite or around the C-suite, not the C-suite just as a place, just as, a, as a metaphor, sure. but to run you know, an enterprise, right? And so there's different leadership required at that level than at that frontline and midline level of management. So Cool. And you can find it on Kindle or where can, where can you find it? Everywhere. It's okay. just go on Amazon.com and type in my name. That's been the easiest way that people have told me they found it. But uh, it'll be anywhere books are sold, frankly. And, nice. and it is everywhere books are sold. The ebook, the Audible book will be out in about a month. And the paperback will be out in about two weeks. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Michael. Thanks, thanks for all your insight and sharing with, uh, with our audience. So thanks. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment below. Let us know uh, just your thoughts and who, who you'd like to see on this show next. All right. See you next time. Sweet. Thank you. Good job, man. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast.